Just take a look outside. Just, just look outside through the, the window over there on, on your left. Don't you love what you see? It's green. It is green. Thank you, Jesus. It is green. And though it may not be the most beautiful day and we have rainstorms going on, it is something that you can treasure if you've ever lived in a part of the country or part of the world that doesn't get much rain. When you see rain, you remember, I remember what it was like when it would rain in Phoenix, and kids would run out into the street. Like, otherwise, they'd be inside in the air conditioning, playing their video games and not seeing one another. But when it rained, like, the whole neighborhood ran into the street. And the rain comes down, and it waters the earth and making it bud and flourish. And many of you have green thumbs. I sure don't, but many of you do. And many green thumb people like to come and spend time during the week here at church and making sure the flowers are well taken care of, making sure that the mulch is applied, making sure that the grass is growing and fertilized and cut well. Our new mowing crew is doing an excellent job, and their goal is to make it look good when you come to church on Sunday morning. And I said, if it can look as good as Bush Stadium Field, then it's really good, and he's getting there. Uh, but they do a great job. And you see, think about all the work that goes into fertilizing and, and planting and watering and caring for the ground and caring for the grass and the trees and the flowers that grow. And yet, ultimately, the rain comes, and that's a sign that God himself is the one who is in charge of the growth. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said to the Corinthian Christians, he said, I planted the seed, and he was talking about the seed of God's word. I planted it, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is really that big a deal but only God who makes things grow. And so God is the one who makes things grow. And in the months to come as we enter into the summer season and we leave the festival season of the church year that's gone from Advent into Christmas into Epiphany into Lent and Easter and Pentecost and today is Holy Trinity Sunday, then we enter into what many Christian churches call ordinary time ordinary time or the time of the church, the Sundays after Pentecost. And during that ordinary time as we have green banners and green pyramids and pastors may wear green stoles as a reminder of growth, growth in the church. And just as God provides growth on his creation, God also provides growth in his new creation in you and me. And so that the growth that happens in our life may indeed be because we receive the seed of God's Word and other people water the seed of God's Word, but ultimately, who deserves the glory? It's God who makes things grow. And so as we embark on a season of growth, both outside and inside, both within and without, we want to look at the things that we are called to focus on and stay focused on as the bride of Christ. We've been journeying through the Easter season and into Pentecost looking at the, the church as the bride of Christ, that even when things are good or things are bad or even when they're really, really ugly, the identity of the Christian church is the bride of Christ, that we have been purchased and won and made the bridegroom's own, that Jesus Christ married himself to you when he died and rose again for you, and so that when you receive that new relationship in faith, you are the bride of Christ. And God can say and, yea, even sing over you, isn't she lovely? And he says that like Stevie Wonder did. And he says it about you and me, not because of our loveliness, but because of his loveliness. Because those who plant and those who water and those who have green thumbs and those who do the work, ultimately, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, are not that big a deal, but only God who makes things grow, only God who makes his church lovely. And so as we wrap this up today, I'd like to look at a sermon from the Apostle Peter given on the first Christian holiday of Pentecost nearly 2,000 years ago as Peter, by the Spirit of God, proclaims Jesus Christ. And today on this Holy Trinity Sunday, we focus upon the nature of our God, who he is 
and we look at who he is and what he has done. That in a combined effort, in a combined work, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all work together to save you and me. That the Father fearfully and wonderfully makes us. That the Son is sent as the only begotten Son of God to save us by his death upon the cross. And then the Father and the Son give the Holy Spirit and pour the Spirit out upon the bride. And so that through the power of Jesus' own Spirit, we not only can know Jesus, but we can make Jesus known to others. So Peter, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 36, this is actually the second half of his Pentecost sermon, and look at what he preaches. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and his foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked people, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on Jesus. David said about this Jesus, and here Peter quotes Psalm 16. I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, continues Peter, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died, and he was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew what God had promised him on oath, that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said in Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter brings it home. He preaches the word, and people start responding. Thousands of people, even on that particular day, said, Brother, what should we do? How do we respond? And thousands of people repented of sin, trusted in Christ, and were baptized. And that growth kept happening in the infant church as the loveliness of the bride of Christ kept expanding, not because of who they were, but because of who he is. And so Peter helps us to stay focused upon the truth of Jesus. And I'd like to highlight four specific things from this brief sermon that Peter can help you and me focus upon as we get to know Jesus Christ and as we grow in Jesus Christ. And the first truth is this is that Jesus revealed his identity and his mission through the signs and the wonders that he did. So Peter, when he's preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, he over and over again focuses upon the fact that Jesus' identity is as the Son of God. Now, if you think about you, if you are a son of someone, that means that you are distinct from your dad, but you come from the same stock the same makeup as your dad. I am Jeff, the son of Bill. I am not Bill, I am Jeff. Bill is a human being, last time I checked. And therefore, Jeff, his son, is also a human being. And so you see what happens when Jesus is described as the son of God. God himself is one with Jesus. Jesus is one with God the Father and God the Spirit. And so Jesus is the Son of God. That is his identity. He is the only begotten Son of the Father who has been sent on a rescue mission to the world. 
And so his mission, his M.O., is to do signs and wonders and miracles. But why? Why was Jesus given as the only begotten Son of the Father for 33 years to walk the face of the earth so that at the age of 30 he would enter into a dedicated time of ministry, including healings and miracles and wonders and signs? Why? Why would he do that? Well, it was for the purpose of showing that he is fully God and can do things that only God can do, but it wasn't for the purpose of doing magic tricks like a David Copperfield. The purpose was to show that Jesus was all about restoring broken lives. So whether he was turning water into wine in a miracle or cleansing a person of leprosy or calling a paralyzed man to stand up, take his mat, and go home, or even raising the likes of Lazarus from the dead, every sign and miracle and wonder Jesus did shows us that he's in the business of restoring broken lives. And all of those signs during Jesus' 33 years, and especially the signs of his three-year ministry, point towards the ultimate sign where he will stretch his arms out and be nailed to the cross. And so that there at the cross, he would take all of humankind, past, present, and future, and he would bear the brokenness of all of our lives so that he could restore us to a right relationship with the Father. Do you see how that works? That Jesus' identity and his mission go hand in hand. And his mission is always to restore broken lives. He is in the mission of taking broken people like us and making us whole in the presence of the Father. Peter focuses us on that, says, focus on this. Who is Jesus and what has Jesus come to do? Secondly, Jesus' death upon the cross was the result both of God's perfect plan and of people's evil deeds. Maybe you've had that dilemma in your mind or you've wondered about that as you've read the Bible or maybe you've had people who are seeking the truth want to know that. So was Jesus murdered as an innocent man or was Jesus sent as the the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan to save the world? And the answer is yes. Yes, that God in a mysterious way can do what we cannot do that he can take the deliberate evil plots of people, even when they're acting sinfully and outside of his will, he can take those evil plans and plottings of people who are wanting to attack and even kill the Son of God, and he can take what is horrible and evil and unjust, and he can use that to accomplish the greatest justice and mercy of all, and that is to make people right with God. And so God can work a Romans 8, 28, He can work all things for good for those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. And so Jesus is both murdered and given. He's both punished by evil people and provided by God the Father as the substitute sacrifice for the sins of the world. And the hope of that is not only that God can work good out of the evil that you and I face, that God can take us as we walk through the valleys and the fiery trials of life, and he says, hold my hand and I'll get you through. But most importantly, God has shown in an ultimate way that the worst, the worst situation in life, the death of the only holy one who ever walked the face of the planet, can be used to accomplish the greatest gift, and that is life and salvation for all who believe. Peter says, focus upon that that God is working for good even when people are doing evil. Number three, Peter helps us to focus upon the truth that Jesus, having died upon the cross, having been buried in the grave, he rises again, and his resurrection and his ascension 40 days later go hand in hand as they both showcase his glory. Now, I don't know what you remember fondly from summer times when you were growing up, but I remember a lot of different things that I did in the neighborhood that I grew up in. And it was a crazy thought that you don't see a whole lot anymore today, but people actually left their houses and interacted with other people in their neighborhoods. It was bizarre. Kids actually left their technology at home and they went outside and played this game called wiffle ball and flashlight tag, and they maybe even 
talk to people. It was, it was amazing. And so nowadays, we have people that can go inside on a device and be playing a video game with someone in, um, in Nepal, and yet they may not know the neighbor two doors down. So you see how crazy that is? But I remember that in some time that was spent in technology growing up, and I'm sure that all of us had, had our limits, and we do have to do that as parents as well. But I love 10 a.m. Central Time on CBS 4 out of St. Louis where my sister and I would watch The Price is Right. <laughs> I mean, Bob Barker was amazing, and let me tell you what I really thought as a preteen boy, what was even more amazing, Barker's beauties. I mean, they were, <laughs> whoo, they were, they were, they were beautiful. And they would come out, and they would give away prizes, and people would play their games, and then you know the show it leads up to the showcase showdown so that those who are the ultimate victors among all the victors receive the ultimate prize, at least as Bob Barker defines what the ultimate prize is. And so if you think about something being showcased, it means that it's lifted up as the ultimate prize. And so Jesus Christ is lifted up in his resurrection, and he ascends to the right hand of the Father, And how do we as Christians know that he has received the ultimate prize and he gives that ultimate prize of never-ending life to us? It's not just that we look back at a historical event that happened, that he is risen from the dead never to die again, but that right now we say, where's Jesus? He's at the right hand of God. He's ruling over the world. He's alive, and death is destroyed as I stand in Jesus Christ. Death is defeated as I am in Jesus Christ, and the glory belongs to him, and in eternal life, he's going to give that glory to us as well. You see that? His resurrection and his ascension and the promise to come again all showcase his glory. And then fourthly, Peter points out in his brief sermon, and we should focus upon this, that Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father And then he receives from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and pours the Spirit out, which you now see and hear. Remember, people were speaking in tongues, different languages. People were hearing the Word of God in a way they could understand. And Peter says this is a continual reality for the bride of Christ, that the Holy Spirit isn't just given one time. Certainly, as we saw in Bowie's baptism today, the Holy Spirit is poured over a life and claims a person as God's own, that the Father, Son, and the Spirit say, you belong to me. And that's a reality that Bowie will have his entire life. He is a child of God. And yet that is a present-day reality for every single one of us who believe, that whenever we wake up to a new day, regardless of what happened in the day before, we arise and we say, I'm a child of God, and I've been given a fresh start in Jesus Christ because of the Holy Spirit. Every time we take and eat and take and drink the body and the blood of Christ, Jesus pours out his spirit into us to fill us with his presence. Every time we take God at his word and and take it in and and, and apply it to our lives, the spirit is poured out into us. Do you see it? It's It's a continual reality of the Holy Spirit to make Jesus known to us and that empower and enable us to make Jesus known to other people. And so that is the truth that Peter focuses us on, the identity and mission of Jesus, the perfect plan of God to use Jesus' death for the salvation of mankind, his resurrection and ascension showcasing his glory, and then the continual promise of the Holy Spirit. But did you notice what Peter did whenever he preached? He quoted someone throughout his message. And that's not only a good literary device to quote other people, it's also a good uh, uh, public speaking device to give give quotes and and time to other people because people like to hear what other people said. But Peter, recognizing that his audience is filled with Israelites, knows that the hero of the Israelite nation is King David. And so as Peter quotes King David, who wrote the majority of the Psalms, And as these people would have known the psalms and used them as their praise and worship songs, 
that he quotes King David in his sermon to show hearers that what he is proclaiming about Jesus Christ is really nothing new. It's only the fulfillment of all that has come and all that's been promised before, and that it has finally arrived, the salvation that's been promised for years and years and years, even through King David, has finally arrived in King David's greater son. And so Peter, in proclaiming Jesus Christ and calling us to stay focused upon him as the source of our growth, he says this in so many words. He says, King David may be the hero of the Jewish nation. You all know what he said. You all like his story. But let me tell you something better. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all creation. And so Jesus Christ is the one who David now stands before in glory. Jesus Christ is the one that David spoke of in the Psalms. That Jesus Christ is the one who King David himself referred to as his own Lord. And if it's good enough for David, fellow Israelites, it's good enough for us that he's the Lord of all creation. And so we stay focused as the people of God upon our source of growth, and as we stay focused upon the nature of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and how they combine their work to save us, we look at Jesus as he's lifted high. The Apostle Paul, a fellow missionary along with Peter, once proclaimed these words in the book of Colossians chapter 1. And as Paul was beginning his short letter to the church at Colossae, what does he do? He doesn't lift up himself as the one who plants the seed of the word. He doesn't focus upon the other preachers and teachers and caregivers who watered the seed of the word. But what does Paul say? He says it's all about him, Jesus Christ. So we close with these words today from Colossians chapter 1, 17 through 20. For Jesus, the Son, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So if things are falling apart, it's not his fault. In him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, his church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he, he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, all that is broken, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And how did he do it? How did he accomplish that? What do you focus on? What is your source of life? Because he did it by making peace through Jesus' blood shed for you and me on the cross. We stay focused upon Jesus because he alone is the source of our growth. May we receive that in Jesus' name, amen.